Good morning, everyone. Hopefully, uh, everyone's having a nice uh, Thursday. Feels good. This first uh, first webinar we've done that that I've been at the office. Patrick didn't feel like coming in today. He's at home, but um, I think you're still muted there. Uh, but we're, we're excited that you could join us for webinar number eight. Um, should you buy individual stocks or funds? Um, this, this is just a fun topic. Um, so there, there's a lot of differing opinions and really when it comes down to it, like, like stock picking, it, 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 it can be fun. I think I think that it plays a big part of it. it, it it's fun to um, be be you know get, in my opinion, many times get lucky in, in picking a fun stock. And and for many of us, at, at some stage of our life, uh, you know, we we've done that. I, I remember, uh, let's see, I mean, close to twenty years ago now, back uh, back when I was playing, getting close to playing junior hockey. Like I, I remember the first two. First two stocks I bought, Apple and uh, J.P. Morgan, and uh, of course I sold them both like six months later for a short-term capital gain. I didn't know anything at the time, but it, it's a really fun um, topic, and, and we're going to go over some of the pros and cons today between buying individual stocks or uh, some funds. So Patrick is going to be co-hosting this uh, webinar with me. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Johan. Um, yeah, we're going to do our best to tag team this with with Johan driving the ship of the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So hopefully it goes all right. Um, I have my email open on my other screen here if anybody is having trouble hearing us or something's not loading right. Um, just shoot me an email. Uh, you can send it to info at OceansideAdvisors.com. I'd be happy to, when I'm not talking, see if I can help you out. Cool. All right. Take it away, Patrick. Um, of course, going to start the webinar with a boring disclaimer. Uh, through this webinar, Oceanside Advisors does not render or offer to render personalized investment or tax advice. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute financial, tax, or legal advice. Compliance will be happy that we, we got through that. Um, uh, so the, the general um, argument for stocks over uh, individual stocks over mutual funds, ETFs. Um, uh, people want to pick the winners, leave the losers behind. Um, kind of why would I hold a, a fund with a couple hundred or a couple thousand positions in it when I could just pick the, the ones that are going to be winners? Um, mutual funds can be more tax, or excuse me, individual stocks can be more tax efficient than mutual funds um, when handled properly. And ETFs and mutual funds have fees where um, you know, obviously individual stocks um, do not. A couple, a uh, couple fun quotes to start us off here. Johan mistaken um, this gentleman for uh, Albert Einstein earlier, which I think you can see the resemblance. Uh, this is Mark Twain. Um, uh, he said, uh, October, this is one of the peculiarly dangerous months to speculate in stocks. The others are July, January, September, April, November, May, March, June, December, August, and February. Um, you know, he's obviously a pretty creative guy, and it's, uh, I think it's a good quote. Um, kind of tough to, tough to have jokes in a webinar where no one can respond, but here we are. Um, one more quote for you from uh, um, John Kenneth Galbraith. He was an economist. Um, there are two kinds of forecasters, those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know. Um, I think we're kind of showing our hand here and how we feel about picking individual stocks pretty early, but um, Johan's going to dive into to why we feel this way. All right. So uh, I know many of you on this, on this webinar uh, also attended, uh, I believe it was the fourth webinar we did. Uh, when we when we took a a look into Dr. Brian Portnoy's book, The Geometry of Wealth, and we we went over a number of things in that webinar. Uh, 
but I, but we actually didn't touch on uh, this portion of the book at all that, that I'm about to go over uh, just, just because I, I figured if we ever did a, a stock picking webinar, um, this, this might be some good information. <clears throat> but so, so the way he opens it up in, in this particular chapter is he refers to this odd investing conundrum. All right. So, so you have two facts here. Um, number one, the stock market has delivered attractive gains over the long run. All right. So, you know, if, if you ask your, your neighbor or friend or, you know, anyone with a, a decent understanding of the way stock markets work, if, if, if you were to ask them, you know, what, what does the stock market, what, what's an average return in, in the long run? Most people will be able to give you an answer, you know, somewhere between eight and 10, you know, maybe 12%. Um, and and, and mo most people understand that. Uh, however, another fact that, that maybe not as many people know, number two, most stocks don't outperform cash over the long run. All right, so th th these are both facts. Um, in the long run, the stock market as a whole has delivered attractive gains. And yet most stocks don't outperform cash over the long run. Okay. Um, so, so dating back to, to 1926, 58% of common stocks have a lifetime return of less than a one month treasury bill, right? Which, which a treasury bill, that, that's, it's a, it's a good proxy for cash. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into this, but, um, so some additional surprising statistics here from Dr. Portnoy and his research. <clears throat> so you can, you can even take a step further. Uh, so, so over the past 90 years, only 4% of companies explain the net gain for the entire U.S. stock market. All right, so the top 86 stocks out of 26,000 accounted for 50% of the 32 trillion in wealth creation during that time. Um, and we have a, um, a fun little example of this. You know, how, how does this work? And, and what it is, it's, it's this statistical concept known as skew. All right, but bring you back to your statistics courses. Maybe you have, um, it might ring a bell, but this concept of skew. And uh, so here, here's, here's a fun example that Patrick put together. Uh, for those of you that know me well, uh, this young lady should look familiar. That's my daughter, Keegan. And, and you know, I, I guess we can't take credit for this uh, little analogy either, because it was Dr. Portnoy that pointed out something similar. We, we changed it a little bit, but uh, let, let's just say here that Keegan, although she is not yet involved in any kind of Girl Scouts, let's say here she is. We will give her her little Girl Scout hat there. And um, yeah, her and her troop, they're going to sell some, some cookies. All right. She's all excited. I mean, who wouldn't want to buy some Girl Scout cookies from that face? All right. So for this hypothetical example, let's just say uh, there are 10 girls in Keegan's troop, her Girl Scout troop. And let's, again, of course, all hypothetical here. Uh, let's say nine of the girls sell 50 boxes of Girl Scout cookies. Keegan, with a little help of her dad, um, let's say she's able to sell 150 boxes. All right, so nine of the girls sell 50 boxes. Keegan sells 150 boxes. All right, that means that the troop as a whole, so all 10 of them have sold uh, 600 boxes, all right? So the way this plays out is that the average Girl Scout sold 60 boxes, all right? 600 boxes divided by the 10 girls in the troop. The average Girl Scout sold 60 boxes. Now, with that being said, only Keegan was above average in terms of the amount of boxes that were sold. 
you know, looking at it another way, it, it, nine of the 10 did not perform to, you know, the, the, the average of the group, right? So nice job, Keegan. You get a, a nice little patch to put on. You, you deserved it. Good job. All right. And, and so the, the reason we bring this up is on a more serious note, this is the exact same thing that happens in the stock market. All right, so, so this is the less fun, more relevant application of SKU. Here we have uh, total lifetime returns of 14,455 US stocks uh, between years of 1989 and 2015. All right, so, so look at this distribution of these 14,000 plus stocks. And this, this is SKU, right? So you'll notice very, very few companies are driving the overall gain. All right, so you have, you have very, very few companies that are, are driving the majority of the market's performance, right? So the obvious, the obvious question is, well, why don't, why doesn't everyone just pick the stocks that are on the far right of the graph here. What, why, why don't we all just pick the winners? And the, 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 the simple answer is, although not impossible, it is, it is highly unlikely that you can, that, that anyone can consistently pick the best performing stocks over time. All right. Um, you know, even you know, Warren Buffett, who many consider the greatest investor of all time, um, he, he, even Warren Buffett has underperformed over the last 15 years of, of his career. It, it, it's very difficult to consistently pick winning stocks. Um, and so, so just a, a, few, a few bullet points here of, of some additional statistics and evidence. Um, of course, a lot of active money managers, right, that are, that are running active mutual funds. I mean, and, and these are professionals, right, that, that have been doing this their whole careers um, that, that, that try to pick stocks and outperform the market. There's a tremendous amount of data and evidence on this. And, and in the typical year, only 17% of stock picking active mutual funds will, will outperform their benchmark. All right, so in other words, very, very difficult to, to guess ahead of time the, the, the mix of stocks. I mean, and just, just look, you know, keep your eyes just on this little bar graph. Like it's really hard to find just that, that select group on the far right here that, that that's truly going to drive the overall market's performance. Um, Carl Richards, who I know I've also mentioned in the past that he has this book called the behavior gap uh, that, that I, I would recommend for anyone that wants a yeah, nice, simple, easy read. But uh, the, the way he defines the behavior gap is the difference between uh, what the market returns so the average return of the market, which you know, we'll just we'll call that eight percent, and uh, the, the the average individual retail investor trying to, well, many of them pick stocks, but the, the average retail investor's return is three percent, right? So you have three percent return for the average investor. The market typically does eight, so you have this behavior. He calls it behavior gap of five percent, right, in between uh, the market and what most investors achieve. And, and really this, this behavior gap, it, it, it's most likely two components, right? You have um, a lot of people trying to time the market, right? So, so they're buying when things feel good. And then uh, at, at the bottom of markets, unfortunately, when, when there's a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety, you see a lot of people sell out. So a lot of it comes to do with market timing. But, but the second component, it, it, it's a lot of people stock picking. Right? It's a lot of people on CNBC. Um, getting advice. And, and I think most of you know how I feel about that. Uh, but nonetheless, sadly, there's this behavior gap. And, and that, that's another reason for that. Uh, more recently, like a, a big concern that, that I have more recently is young investors, okay, young investors that maybe have only, um, you know, been looking at markets for the, the, the past year or two, even five years. Right, because we, we've had this period of time where recently, 
where like the large cap growth market. So, so these big names, these big companies that everyone's heard of, right? Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, Facebook, all these large cap tech names in the last few years have been the best performing stocks. And, and I think, um, unfortunately, I think for some young investors, they, they think that's the norm. And I, I just, I think it's important that we point out that um, history tells us that, that that's not the norm at all. Um, in, in fact, the majority of the time we, we see the, the highest return come from actually the opposite end of the market. So, so the majority of the return, the, the, the higher returns come from the small cap value space. And you know, so, so, so you, you look at, um, well, there's a podcast that I also recommend if, if people want to dig into it a little bit deeper, but great podcast. It's called The, the Rational Reminder. And uh, m m much like us, they take a very evidence-based, uh, you know, driven approach to, to really look at data and, and try to figure out the best, the, the best way to invest over, over the long term. And they, they, they brought up, they're trying to draw some parallels between um, like today's environment where you have all these large cap growth companies that everyone's heard of and they're all doing so well. Um, and, and you look at the past. And so a couple examples that they gave that I thought were really interesting was, um, for example, like Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone, which is eventually bought out by what is now AT&T. Company does exceptionally well, you know, revolutionary technology, of course, right? Like you don't have a telephone, but now you do. And, and they looked at, um, of course, that period of innovation, that company does extremely well. And then once they're at the top, the, the forward returns, you know, moving forward from that were very mediocre, actually underperforming uh, the broader market from that point forward. The same happened with Ford Motor Company, right? So Henry, Henry Ford comes along, the general public doesn't have cars, now they do. Of course, there's tremendous growth in the company. But then from that point forward, um, after they reach the top, very mediocre average returns. Okay, uh, same can be said for GE, General Electric, more, more recently. And they make the argument like, because sometimes, sometimes you know, what you hear from people today is, oh, these companies are, are so innovative, you know, it's never been done before. And, and I don't know, is, is, was the telephone and the car less revolutionary than social media or a solar car? Yeah, I, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's um, a tough case to make. So uh, just, just keep, keep that in mind. So yeah, I, I know sometimes we have some younger, uh, younger uh, viewers of these webinars and, and I just, I wanna, I wanna make sure we, we get the message through to them that the majority of the time, the, these big, large companies, um, they're, they're not always going to be outperforming. So sorry for going on for so long there, but it's, it's just a really important point um, one more, one more uh, example to to glom on there, um, and something I'm not sure you touched on. But uh, if you look at the the window that we're looking at, it's from 1989 to 2015, um, and that's not to say that a company that isn't in that um, you know 2844 group on the far end that Johan has circled would like couldn't shift in the next 10 years backwards. Um, and a really good example of that that happened, and I'm not sure you know what month this study was run, but um, Valiant Pharmaceuticals was uh, early '90s was trading at 70 or 80 cents a share, climbed up um, to a couple hundred dollars a share, and uh, right in two, 2015 was when they kind of plummeted, and you know now they're down to 16 dollars a share. So even in the time that this was this research was done they might be in that circled group on the far side. And, you know, now today they're, they're going to be shifted. I mean, still much higher than, um, than a lot, but they're going to be shifted much further left. So it's um, even if you pick the winners, it, it depends on, you know, the whole timing of it can be uh, another wrench thrown in there. Yep. And, and I know I've spent a lot of time on the slide already, but I just want to make one more additional point. I had in my notes here that I didn't mention. Uh, and this is, uh, to, to always remember that stock returns 
like in the future, they're not based on how great a company is and how well they're performing. The growth is going to be, the performance of the stock is going to be more so based on how well does that company perform relative to the current market expectations, right? So, you know, you, you look at a company um, like Apple or Amazon, all these companies that are doing so many things well, it, it, it's just important to remember for, for them to continue to have outsized returns, that, that they can't just continue to um, perform well, that they have to like exceed market expectations, which is a, a totally another level, but you know, very hard to achieve. So by no means are we predicting like these companies are um, gonna have horrible years, that, that's quite the, op quite, quite the con contrary. Uh, more so, yeah, it, it's just, it, it's much more likely that you'll see these big companies have, uh, in, in the coming years, have more average returns and, and you'll likely see leadership come from other areas of the market. Okay, that was probably the longest slide of webinar we've ever done. Hopefully we didn't lose <laughs> it. Uh, else? Clear. So what happens if you spend too much time on a slide, you lose. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so on to, on to points two and three for the argument for stocks or individual stocks. Um, stocks are more tax efficient. Um, kind of worth, worth noting before really diving into it that it isn't that stocks by themselves are more tax efficient. It still takes the proper management of said stocks to be tax efficient. Um, I think Johanna will, will chime in at some point with that. But uh, so mutual funds pass on capital gains distributions. Um, a capital gains distribution is when a, a mutual fund sells um, sells securities that have appreciated in value, um, doesn't have any losses to offset, um, and towards the end of the year, uh, they they have to make those distributions as gains to shareholders. Um, the same way that if throughout a year you were managing individual stocks and you wanted to, you know, if if you had a a target on a certain company that once the stock hits X dollars, we want to sell the, the same way you would have a gain if you were managing individual stocks. The difference between um, the mutual funds and, and individual stocks with that is within a mutual fund, Patrick Hall at Oceanside Advisors has, you know, no claim or business telling a fund manager when they should or shouldn't sell anything. We're kind of outsourcing that portion of it. Um, and these are usually paid out once a year in December. Yeah, and then just one more note on this is, you know, s stocks can be more tax efficient, but but only if you have the proper holding periods. So, um, yeah, so sometimes uh, some of the younger people that we help um, that are maybe new to, to picking stocks and so forth, uh, they, they don't sometimes understand that if you don't hold a stock for 365 days, um, it, 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 if, if you sell it before that time, it, it becomes a, a short-term capital gain, which means it ends up just simply going on your ordinary income uh, come tax time. Uh, and, and therefore, if, if, if you're just holding stocks for six months or, or nine months and you're, you're selling them, uh, if you're in a high tax bracket, like you, you might be losing half of your gain anyway to, to taxes. So if, if not, cognizant of your holding periods, many times trading stocks can be uh, less tax efficient. Um, and, and to Johan's point there that, uh, I mean, you can, you can see it through actively managed funds that um, oftentimes when you are, when, when people or fund managers are picking stocks and that is their, they're picking stocks and trying to market time in some capacity is when you start to build up short-term capital gains, which uh, again is less tax efficient. Um, so how do we solve this problem using funds or how do we limit taxes using funds? Um, first and foremost, uh, and, and we would hope that someone would do this if they were um, using individual stocks or bonds as well, um, is asset location. Johan, you wanna take this slide? I think this one was supposed to be yours, but I got excited. 
Yeah. And, no, and, and this idea of asset location, this just means holding the least tax efficient investment um, in retirement accounts, right? So, so for example, uh, if, if, if you have to own um, uh, like a high yield bond that, that's going to pay ordinary income or uh, many times like real estate investment trusts, or like a re any income that comes off that is ordinary. Just holding those, the types of assets that are the least tax efficient, like making sure those are in your retirement accounts. And then, um, and, and that way in, in your taxable accounts, your non-retirement accounts, that this, those are, you typically want to be a little bit more growth oriented, right? So try to limit the ordinary income that is um, being paid to you out of funds that are, that are in a non-qualified account. Uh, Patrick had touched on this a little bit earlier, but if, if you're looking at different exchange traded funds, you know, ETFs or, or mutual funds, um, many times these funds with the higher turnover ratios. So this just means managers that are a little bit more active, right? So they're buying and selling. And m much like the point we made a little bit earlier, the same thing applies like inside of a mutual fund. So if a fund manager is uh, buying a position and selling it six months later, right? That, that short-term capital gains many times gets passed on to the, um, to, to the owner of that fund in the form of a short-term capital gains distribution um, that, that comes at the end of the year. So uh, just, just being very aware of, so, so of course we, we, I think you're getting a good sense of, of uh, where we come down on all this, but uh, we, we would not be a fan of you know, the high turnover funds where a manager is going to be buying and selling frequently within a fund because that's going to mean higher tax obligations for uh, the, the, the clients that we help. Uh, so, so we try to avoid those. There's also what's called tax managed funds, right? So sometimes this makes sense to look at um, for, for somebody that is in a higher tax bracket and we have, um, uh, so some non-qualified money, right? So some non-retirement money that needs to be invest. So, so you have these tax managed funds and these are just particularly uh, cognizant of doing some of the, um, the, 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 the tax mitigation techniques that we do, that, that we implement for um, some of the clients that we help. All right, now I'm up. Um, yeah, so yeah, put, Point number three here in the argument against mutual funds is that ETFs and mutual funds have fees. Um, almost all of them have some sort of expense ratio. Uh, I know Fidelity does the, and I think a couple, couple other uh, firms do it now, an S&P index fund that, that has a zero basis point expense ratio. Um, but almost all mutual funds and ETFs have expense ratios. Um, expense ratio is used to compensate fund managers, you know, cover the costs of managing the fund, investment research, asset allocation, trading services, um, kind of standard stuff. It, more or less, this is um, how they are paid for almost, I don't want to say doing the stock picking, but for selecting the investments. Um, uh, and, and the argument for stocks versus funds and uh, or ETFs and mutual funds is that many brokerage firms, um, Fidelity, I believe has done it, Schwab, TD, um, commission free trading on all individual stocks. Um, so it's, you know, obviously you're, you're paying something versus you're paying nothing. Um, as Johan loves to say all the time, and I have glommed on to, um, there's no free lunch, uh, especially when it comes to investing. Um, Researching and selecting individual stocks is an expensive and time consuming task. Um, a lot of advisors that are choosing to invest in individual stocks are likely doing this in one of two ways. Um, way number one, uh, passing the cost of time and research on through their advisory fee. So, um, and it's not to say that they don't deserve to be compensated for their research and efforts. Um, it's just to say that you're going to work with somebody who's going to choose individual stocks, they're likely going to charge you in some capacity for that. 
Um, the other option is uh, paying a fee to utilize a turnkey asset management program. Um, some people say platform instead of program. Um, and uh, on this point, um, a, a TAMP is basically a, another company that you pay to provide investment research, asset allocation, trading services. They basically manage the portfolio side of things. Um, and a little snarky, but um, question is if that if that sounds familiar, it's because a, a TAMP is more or less doing exactly what uh, a fund manager at a mutual fund is doing. Um, and, and there is a place for TAMPs. Um, a lot of advisors these days are starting to use TAMPs to kind of free up their time more so they don't have to deal with the trading and back office side of things. Um, you can pay a TAMP to do it. And a lot of times the those advisors, when you sign a sign the IA investment advisory agreement with them, they, you know, our fee is this percent, the TAMPS fee is that percent. And um, we'll kind of cover that here on the next slide. Yeah, and maybe it's just worth bringing up again, you know, research and, researching and selecting these indiv individual stocks is expensive and time consuming. And, you know, as we've shown a few slides ago, it's only 17% of the time it works on average. Uh, so I don't know, it's just, it, it, in our opinion, it, it's an additional layer of costs, regardless of how you're doing it, whether through an active fund manager um, you know, or someone picking stocks, uh, you, you're likely going to pay for it in the end, uh, either through higher fees or more likely poor performance. Uh. Solving the fee problem. Uh, so this is a quote from Michael Kitsis. Uh, we've referenced him a handful of times. He's um, uh, has a podcast, has a blog. Um, he's a CFP, uh, started as an advisor years ago and has kind of pivoted more towards trying to help educate more advisors. Um, I think his thought being why help, you know, 100 to 200 clients when I can you know, teach advisors and have them help more people. Um, this is a quote from an article he wrote about uh, selecting TAMPs. Um, I see a lot of TAMPs today that are more in the 40 to 60 basis point range. Some lower prices offering, or some lower price offerings as low as 25 to 35 basis points. Um, the average expense ratios of Vanguard funds, 10 basis points. We, you know, we like Vanguard. They're not our absolute favorite, but we, we do use Vanguard a bit. Um, and Vanguard is pretty well known as like the, the floor when it comes to expenses um, in the mutual fund industry uh, and just the average expense ratios um, within the industry, 57 basis points. So um, I, I looked up yesterday to, to kind of confirm where our portfolios fit in. I think we range from an average expense ratio of seven basis points to 40. Um, so again, whether kind of back to the no free lunch, whether you're paying a TAMP or uh, it's, whether you're paying a TAMP or you're paying a mutual fund, fund manager, it's, um, you know, investing isn't free. All right, so just uh, to try to wrap up uh, today, uh, in, in, in our opinion, um, and you know, we, we try to, we always try to be as objective as possible. Um, you know, being an independent firm that, that custodies our clients' assets with, you know, TD Ameritrade and Charles Schwab, like we're always looking for really the, the, the best, the best way to, to manage the client's money that, that, um, many of you have entrusted in us and, um, so if, if that, if that ever someday, if the data ever suggests like there's a better way to do it and maybe there, there's some manager that figures out how to pick stocks really well, like we, we, we would, um, we would want to do that. Um, uh, but with, with the overwhelming amount of evidence that's out there, um, you know, whether it's us building portfolios or for, for those of you listening that manage assets on your own, there's just a lot of evidence that, that suggests a mix of high quality funds can provide a level of diversification that 
you, you just you cannot receive um, when selecting individual stocks. Proper asset allocation, uh, low turnover funds and tax managed funds, you know, the, the, those can help limit your tax liability. And I, I guess I kind of just touched on um, the, the, this last point kind of in the, the first bullet point, but th there's no free lunch. And, and we, we just, we, we really believe that uh, for, for most people in the long run, uh, investing in low cost mutual funds and exchange traded funds will likely produce better results than picking individual stocks. And, uh, you know, going back to what I said at the very beginning of the webinar today, like I, stock picking is fun. Like I, I, I remember doing it, um, you know, back in junior hockey, back when I was at Ohio state, even early in my career, here you know just just kind of um we, we we used to do a little bit of it um and and it's just that the overwhelming evidence uh, suggests it, it, it's not the best way to do it and um at the same time you know we we, we have some and and yeah i'll just add one more thing i've been rambling a little bit too much today but it, it is it is a topic that uh i have a lot of conviction on um you know for some people you know the stock picking might might be more of like a hobby and, and so like for some of our clients, you know, we'll, we'll manage the, the core portfolio, like the important part of maybe their retirement that, you know, that they just, they, they can't put at risk and, and jeopardize with the stock picking strategy. But we might hold, you know, a small basket on the side that's, that's more for the client to pick stocks because it is fun. And I, I understand that. And it, it feels really good to, to be right. Um, but uh, with that being said, um, Patrick, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, just one more uh, comment on the first bullet point there that um, I actually don't think we touched on it all to, today because all our all of the research is U.S. based. Um, it it can be really challenging. You know, it's one thing to do your research on individual stocks within the United States when the information is easier to access and easier to access and the accounting's pretty standardized across the board um even more like it starts to get much much more challenging when you start to talk international stocks and you want to bring them into the fold um so at the very least if you're someone that wants to pick individual stocks like when it comes to balancing a portfolio with international holdings you're going to want to um maybe you can see it on that point and and use some mutual funds because it's um there's definitely a time to trust the experts that have the resources to do the proper research. And, and I, th I think it's something that we think is extremely challenging to do with any kind of consistency to begin with. When you start talking about looking at companies in Europe and Asia and, you know, it, it you know, you had to, you almost have to pick mutual funds when it comes to internationals, in my opinion. And, and uh, yeah, so, so we just had, uh, We've got a few questions here. Uh, I think maybe just take one or two. Uh, so one question that just came in from from Steve. Um, what, what do you do when a client calls in and wants to buy a stock? Uh, typically, what, what I will say is, um, uh, you know, it's it, it, of course it's it's. It's your money, right? So if, if, if you want to buy a stock, that that's um, we're totally fine with that. It, usually, I'll usually I'll ask the question like, what piece of information do you have? Do you know about this stock that, that the other eighty-two million market participants doesn't already know? Yeah, you know, what 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 edge do you have? Um, but if but if so, if somebody wants to buy a stock, we we'll, we'll, we will put it in the portfolio, and then what we do from a rebalancing standpoint, we just exclude it from rebalancing. So it almost, it stands alone in the, in the portfolio. Uh, so, so usually we don't push back much, much if, if somebody wants to buy a stock, um, where we will push back a little bit more is the sizing of that position. And that just goes, that just goes back to, um, you know, ultimately it's our job to make sure everyone that we help has the ability to, to live the lifestyles that they, they want to live. And, um, we, we just we would never want to you know buy an individual stock or position that that's too big that that 
to, might put that lifestyle in jeopardy. So, uh, yeah, with, with that being said, again, thank you for, for joining us again on webinar uh, number eight. Gosh, time's flying. I can't believe it's, it's almost the end of September. Crazy. Yeah. But uh, we, we, we thank everyone for, for um, joining and um, you'd be happy to, to follow up with uh, any other questions. And what I'll do, I'm gonna email the other, there's a number of questions coming in right now. Uh, we'll send emails to, to those of you that put questions on here. And of course, we're only an email or a phone call away. If you ever think of uh, any additional questions or if, if you wanna debate me on this uh, <laughs> topic, uh, I don't know, it, it's always fun visiting with you. So. Uh, hope everyone has a blessed day and we will we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks for joining us.